Okay, let us start our today's <coughs> seminar. Our today's speaker is uh, Timur Garipov, master student from Moscow State University. Uh, he will tell us about uh, our recent results um, in exploring the, the landscape of uh, the loss functions in deep neural networks. So the results are somewhat uh, surprising, astonishing for us. Uh, that's why I think that uh, the, the, the talk will be quite interesting and it would be very great if you could uh, come up with uh, any kind of suggestions for the further experiments. Because this is uh, the intermediate results of ongoing research. So we really need some kind of discussion. So if you have any ideas, feel welcome to, to sound them. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. I'm now <coughs> going to tell you about our joint project with Pavel Ismailov, Dmitry Podoprichin, Dmitry Vetrov, and Andrew Gordon Wilson. So, uh, my talk will be divided in uh, three parts. The first part is about the lost surfaces of deep neural networks. And the second part is about ensembling, and the last part, part is about weight averaging. Uh, so let's start with the lost surfaces of deep neural network. And let's think, what do we know about these surfaces? Uh, to be honest, we don't know very much. And the main problem with the research on this topic is that uh, neural networks depends on millions of parameters, so we work in extremely high dimensional space and quite hard to obtain some meaningful results there. <coughs> uh, we know that loss functions of deep neural networks are highly non convex, <coughs> and in this work we were interested in the geometric properties of the loss surfaces uh, near the optimal points. We know that even in the simple neural networks architectures where might be a huge number of local optimas and this number could grow exponentially in the number of parameters. Uh, let's take a look at this visualization. To obtain this visualization we did the following. We took three dependently trained networks. By, mean, by this I mean that we took three uh, random initializations, run training procedure from these initializations, and uh, represent the obtained networks as the points in the weight space. After that, we spent a plane uh, through these three points and draw the load surface in this plane. So we can see if we connect uh, two local optima with the uh, line segment, then the loss in the intermediate point of the segment will be quite high. Actually, is the true loss or stochastic one? It's the true loss computed on the whole data set. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, points in the middle uh, make random guess predictions. We are quite bad. It's the typical non convexity. Uh, we were interested on the following point. Uh, could we connect uh, with local optima with some path such that loss won't be very high along this path? And actually, we can do that. So, in these visualizations, we took two optima from the previous slide and find paths between them. Uh, and these paths are near constant loss. Uh, so, it's the main result of, I think, of our first paper. <coughs> and now, um, let's discuss how our procedure for connection and when. Uh, Take a look on the results. So uh, consider. Uh, so what's important on the previous pictures uh, that both curves uh, lie in the same plane, right? No, where is it is different. Place. No, huh? I mean, I mean uh, the whole path uh, lies in, in yes. one plane. Yeah. Because in the general case, the Z curve uh, might not lie in the two-dimensional plane. Yeah. But it's the, mm -hmm. it's the most simple curves, and the, the, uh, all of the points of the curve lie in the plane of the visualization, and same holds here. Uh, okay, uh, let's consider a deep neural network loss function. It could be a usual uh, cross entropy loss for the classification. And let's say we obtain two local optima, W1 and W2, we want to connect. Uh, we define a path between this optima as a continuous curve with a phi with parameter theta. A phi is a continuous mapping from the segment between 0 and 1 to the weight space of neural network. So we want our, our path to connect with the optima, so we uh, 
wants the path to hold this condition. So the phi of 0 equals w1 and phi of 1 equals w2. Uh, so as I as us, uh, our curve uh, de fully defined by the value of theta, our goal is to find good values of theta. And we formulate this task as an optimization problem. And we want to optimize the loss along the curve. So we compute the integral of the loss function along the points of the curve. And uh, here we normalize it by the length of the curve. If phi is smooth enough, we could express these integrals using derivatives. And what is the family for phi? Just any curve? Uh, we will consider specific parameterizations. Well, now I talk about the general method. Uh, so how can we perform this optimization? We formulate this problem as a stochastic optimization problem. So we rewrite as loss this way. And now let's consider the expression in the brackets. This expression is non-negative and it's normalized. So we can treat it as a probability density function over t. So we call this distribution q and write our loss criterion as an expectation over q. <coughs> so if we could represent our loss as an expectation, we could apply stochastic optimization. But here's the problem that, uh, in general, the stochastic gradient of this expectation is intractable. Since for general, uh, for arbitrary, we cannot compute this curve length for a, 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 an arbitrary curve. Uh, instead of this, we replace the distribution Q with the uniform distribution over T. So the difference here that this distribution is uniform over T and this distribution is uniform along the curve length. Uh, of course, in general, these two distributions are different, but the value of the integral um, of this integral and this one will be close if our loss functions are roughly constant along the path. And we observe that, that uh, this assumption holds in our, our experiments. And uh, this approximation allows us a simple procedure <coughs> by which Why we Why aren't they the same? Hmm? Why are they not the same, these two expressions? Because it seems uh, simply like uh, some kind of reparameterization of the mm -hmm. curve. In general, we are different. Uh, if we, for example, consider a polygonal chain parameterization for our curve, let's say we want to connect two points mm -hmm. with a polygonal chain, but uh, we have different lengths of these segments. Then, uh, with, pro with probability, um, we will look at as follows. Mm -hmm. Here it will be 1 divided by L1. And here it will be. But vice versa. <laughs> because in the picture, L2 is greater than L1. Oh. But, but in mm -hmm. the first half of the, this segment, it will be 1 divided by L2, and in the second. And what about Bezier curves? Uh, How do we parameterize Bezier curve with a uniform distribution from 0 to 1? Uh, Isn't the only problem with this that it is discontinuous? So no, if it was continuous. Not. The problem, the problem is that. Discontinuity. It's the problem that uh, <coughs> both segments have different uh, lengths. And we would like the intermediate point to be at one half. But can you just put like one probability mass, like one half on L1 and uh, one half on L2, and that's it? So it just depends on the different parameterization, like nonlinear shift in the parameterization of the curve. Yeah, but the problem is with this integral. We can't, can't evaluate it. And in general case, we can sample from this distribution since we don't know the normal constant. For example, for the Bezier curve, you can't analytically compute this integral. And so we can't use any kind of parameterization here. So um, we use just this simple objective and 
it turns out that using this objective is enough to find uh, good curves. How do you enforce that your curves are 2D somewhat, that they lie in the same plane? Oh, it's a question of the parameterization. Yeah. <laughs> so, are there any questions about the connection uh, procedures? What we do here is just sample at each iteration of the optimization, we sample t from the uniform distribution, then compute gradient with respect to parameters theta and perform stochastic gradient updates. So, now let's talk about the parameterization. So if we don't want to use the line segment, we can use a polychain. This is just the chain of two line segments. It's the simple case. Uh, to define this curve, uh, we have to specify three points in the weight space. Two endpoints, W1 and W2, and one intermediate point, theta. And, uh, and our useful quantization is Bezier curve, which provides us smooth a way to define a smooth curve in the weight space. And in the simple case of the quadratic Bezier curve, we need to define two endpoints, W1 and W2, and uh, some intermediate point, theta. So for these parameterizations, uh, the curves line in, uh, in the same plane. Because where are span, uh, mm, you can see that points on the curve are uh, Uh, it's just the, the complex combination of the three points. Mm -hmm. So it allows this line in the plane to paint by these three points. If we consider curves with larger values of n, a curve with n bands, when it won't lie in the one plane. Yeah. <laughs> so always in this form. <coughs> but a uh, simple parameterization is enough to find, to connect Optima in space of neural network. So we didn't experiment much with larger numbers. Okay. So actually, actually this means that there exist uh, two-dimensional points such that uh, we can connect arbitrary local yeah. extremes with a well, narrow okay, uh, within the region, region of uh, all of uh, all laws. Yeah. Uh, so before we Take a look on the result. Let's pay attention to the following moment. So, uh, most of modern architectures incorporate batch normalization layers, and batch normalization works in different modes in the training phase and in the testing phase. But before this, before this point, all the surface plots you showed were drain plots. Yes. Okay. Uh, what about batch normalization? Uh, let's consider the case of training a single model, then batch normalization works as follows. So we took a batch of output of the alpha layer, x, compute a batch, um, mean and standard deviation over the batch and use them for normalizing the outputs of the layer. Uh, when we're training a curve, at each step we sample value of t, fixed it, and if we have t, we can compute weights, uh, phi of t, and for given weights, we can perform a forward pass of the network and compute uh, mu and sigma over the batch as always. So in the training, there's no problem, but what about <coughs> testing? When we, at the testing phase, for a single model, we replace batch statistics <coughs> with the <coughs> mu tilde and sigma tilde with the uh, computed as a running average of these statistics. But if we want to evaluate an arbitrary point on a curve, we can't compute these running averages for all possible values of t. So we do the following. We fix t, fix weights, phi of t, and for given weights, we make an uh, additional pass over the training data set in order to evaluate these statistics. Do you mean over the whole weights? Yes, over the whole train data set. For each point on the curve? Yes. Yes, it's a quite expensive procedure, but... Mm. Like, uh, procedure is quite straightforward, but uh, it's important to do it. 
And it turns out that people sometimes forget to recompute the patch normalization statistics when they change the weights of the neural net. And it could affect the performance of the network. This would mean to forget when, when like, are, because are, aren't those statistics usually computed like when you find you, when you train, you just compute. Yeah. And then like uh, usually there is like train mode and evaluation no. like everywhere. For example, you want to like make some visualization. It's like the simple example, you want to mm, take two points in the weight space and want to evaluate some intermediate. Well, basically, it's the same example as in, if the curves. Then, uh, if you here you change the weights and you have to estimate statistics for um, the same holds when we do the plane visualization. We took our plane. And when we want to evaluate arbitrary point in this plane, we have to recompute statistical batch normalization for this plane. Uh, and we will talk about it later when we will do the weights averaging. And sometimes when people average the weights, we uh, don't compute statistical batch normalization, which decrease the performance of the net. Uh, so here are the pictures for the uh, deep residual network on CIFAR 100. The, in the top row, <coughs> there are visualizations of the train loss, and in the bottom row, we will visualize the test error. In the left column, there are three independently trained networks. In the middle column, Bezier curves connected to Optimus. And the last column responds to polygonal chain. Why do you have different color maps on top and bottom? Uh, on top and bottom? Like, uh, like I see. So here it's train loss and it's test error. So oh. count loss. Okay. Yeah. So it would be just much more clean to compute loss loss or error error. Uh, because otherwise, like it's. Uh, it's going to so be. It's clear whether the difference is caused by switching from loss to error or by switching from train to test. I guess this yes, was the question. Yes, so like, I actually got very confused. Yeah, but we, mm, we think that the, on train we care more about the loss, and in the test we're interested on the error. Like, I guess, uh, but like, uh, the study is incomplete without tomorrow's. Uh, yeah, we, we evaluated like, different characteristics of uh, that curves. We compute the, the two integrals I was talking about before, and uh, maximum value of the loss and error along the curve. We gathered all these numbers in like huge table. <coughs> you can find it in our paper, but I excluded it from the presentation. Because like numbers are boring and everybody likes people. I want tomorrow. Huh? I want tomorrow to see. Okay. You can find it in the paper. Uh, so we expect, uh, so we can s say that we are able to connect to Optimus uh, with the path of near constant loss both on train and test. Moreover, we conduct experiments on a variety of architectures. Here are the same pictures for the VGG. It is interesting to connect VGG because uh, VGG doesn't have neither by normalization, no residual connections, so the properties of loss surface are quite different compared to the reason network. And so here we can see that we are able to connect VGG as well. And we can say that these like, values of the good points are much thinner for the VGG than for reason network. So this architecture dif has different have different properties of the loss surface. Do you have any hypothesis as to why these arrays are more narrow for VGG? And are they actually more narrow, yeah. or, or is this like artifact of visualization? So how, how, do, we measure, how do we measure narrowness? It's just like visual analysis, yeah. Uh, I think it's hard to because come up with some... Like a, it really depends on like which points you're trying to connect, how far those are from each other. Yeah. 
it's I think it also depends on the dimensionality of the weight space yeah, and many yeah, other yeah. factors. So it's uh, it doesn't make sense to, to, to compare pictures from different slides to compare the width. <coughs> So, just the three days after we published our results on the archive, it turns out that the similar results were independently obtained by our research group. There is a paper, <coughs> essentially no barriers in their network energy landscape by Jackson et al. And we provide another method for connecting optima uh, in, the, in the weight space. We find curves in the form of uh, polygonal chains with multiple bands. And for finding these curves, we use algorithm was what was originally proposed for finding low energy paths in molecular chemistry. It's like every group used the tools that they know how to use. So we work with stochastic optimization. This group works with tools from computation. It's, it is, we are near the end of, uh, of the first part of the talk, and now we are switching to the ensemble. May I ask a question? Yes. Have you varied uh, the points from which you interpolate? Oh, sorry? Uh, you start with two, uh, two networks. Yes. Have you tried different combinations of networks, different uh, models after different initializations? Yeah, we connected like two different. Yeah. And the question is uh, whether this is a special effect divided with one network or with different networks, and it doesn't <coughs> depend on uh, initializations. On uh, so, is it possible to to to, to connect uh, completely different local external? And the, the 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 answer is yes. So this effect is reproduced many times in different architectures with yeah. different initialization strategies. Uh -huh. So probably we, we may conclude that uh, any arbitrary two local externals can be connected. Uh, within the region of uh, all of us. And what about the uh, layers? Deeper or um, it was well, the, 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 the shallow one was uh, 148 layers, resonant 148. Uh, Seems to be quite deep. Uh, I mean, uh, you can see this picture on uh, every layer. Mm. We yeah. we see this picture not on the layer, I mean, the whole in the whole weight space set of the weights. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, of course, we can connect two points in the parameter space with the minimum loss. <laughs> but uh, in your pictures, there are the loss is the same, uh, like in the minimums. Is it uh, what uh, is true? So, is it the minimum value of loss is all along the way, or we just find the minimum way with the minimum loss? And along the way, there are much the loss is much more high. It's hard, but not very much. So. Uh, Yes, of course we don't. Uh, we, we can't find a perfect path. That some some uh, there are always some spikes in the loss along the curve, but this loss turns out to be very high. Okay. Uh, so if we have several networks, it is a good idea to form ensemble using them. And if we have a curve in the weight space, we have uh, infinite supply of neural networks, and we can use them for to form an ensemble. We tried that idea, and uh, so to form an ensemble from the curve, we sample several values of t, uh, collect weights phi of t, and ensemble corresponding networks. Uh, as I said before, we use such parameterizations that to define a curve, we need to store uh, three networks, two endpoints and one intermediate point. Uh, so. It is a good idea to compare this ensemble with the ensemble of three independently trained networks, and it turns out that the curve ensemble works pretty the same as the uh, three independently trained networks. Yes? Uh, are there any problems with batch normalization? <coughs> we already do uh, averaging along uh, ensemble. And what the problem? Uh, so for each uh, network sampled from the curve, you need to pre compute batch normalization statistics. Yeah. That's yes, it is. And yeah, so we find that uh, so it was interesting to try this ensemble, but we find that this procedure are not very applicable. So 
uh, what we conducted the following experiment with the ensemble to obtain this picture we did the following uh, we took two independently trained optimus connect them with the curve phi of t and when we uh, look at the ensemble of two networks so we make of make ensemble sorry could you please take black mark what? okay whoa Thank you. Thank you. And we mm, consider the following ensembles. So ensemble consists of two network. The first network is the endpoint, just the W zero, and the second uh, network is phi of t, is a, a, an arbitrary point on the curve, and we. Mm, on the plot, we plot the error of such ensemble as a function of t. And we did so not only for our find curve, but for a linear segment connected, connecting to Optimus, and for a segment started originated in W0, we pointed in random direction. So here are three curves in our plot. Uh, so at the left end of the plot, we have an error of the ensemble of W0 with itself, so with just the error of W0. And when we go away from the W0 along our trained polychain, we observe that the train error decreases. Test. Uh, yeah, test error decreases. And at the end, we obtain the ensemble of W0 and W1, both for the polygonal chain and for the light signal. Uh, Excuse me, I think I missed it. What are the weights? We equal weight. Just one half and one half. So we. I guess not the weights of the. Yeah, so just like, aren't you supposed to move from uh, W0 to W1? Yes. Like, but like that one, the y on the right points, like uh, not all the curves and at the same point. Yeah, uh, the green line corresponds to a segment started from W0 pointing in random direction. Okay. So we it, uh, make ensemble worse and at some point, point on the random direction makes random, uh, random guess and error of the ensemble is roughly equal to the uh, error of the W0. Uh, so why do we make this experiment? So uh, the quality of the ensemble depends on the two features. The first feature is the quality of the uh, individual members of the ensemble. So you, have, you want to collect good points to form an ensemble. And the second feature is the diverse points. So if you want to form an ensemble, you want your networks to make diverse prediction, because if uh, predictions will be cor correlated, you won't receive any gain. Uh, Timon, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but uh, do you have any intuition of the behavior of the green, cur uh, green curve? Why is it is it almost constant from t uh, more than uh, 0.3? Yeah, I already said that. that uh, so if we go in far, far enough in the random direction, right. this point became uh, to produce uh, random guess prediction. And, and we are moving when we random assemble a random network and train mm -hmm. network with predictions of the train network dominates. Uh, and why don't it dominate uh, when t is smaller? <coughs> because when t is small, then uh, the green curve go, goes up. So our predictions uh, become worse and worse. Yeah. Then after some point, uh, the prediction accuracy starts decreasing, and mm -hmm. then it stabilizes at the quality of the W0. What is the intuition? So 
So here I think we have, if we close to W0, we have some correlated prediction, but from the corrupted network. So it's not very good ensemble. Uh, so these two points are correlated, and this one is worse than the W0. Mm. Are you sure that this uh, green bump is not a random effect? No, I'm not sure. The, 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 this is why I'm asking. I have one hypothesis okay. why it happens. Uh, because if you, cho if you choose a random direction, then probably after a while uh, your weights are such that uh, it doesn't produce random predictions. It just produces some kind of constant predictions. So it produces uniform distribution over the whole space of clusters. And this is why if we average uniform distribution with a, some reasonable distribution, which is given by W0, then we obtain uh, the accuracy exactly like W0. But we can... No more, no less. If our uh, random direction network produced really random predictions, uh, then the result of averaging random predictions with the predictions of W0 would become worse than the predictions by W0. You see? Yeah. Maybe it's the case. Yeah. So I think we should we should uh, clarify it anyway. Okay. Afterwards. So, but uh, the curve of the interest for us here is the real curve, is the four train curve, mm, polygonal chain, and what we can see here, what we can move not far away from the W zero to obtain to increase the quality of the ensemble. So it's here. If we take points here on the curve, it provides us good predictions, and these two points are quite diverse, so we form a good ensemble. So we tried to uh, come up with the method which makes it possible to start from the good point, make a small step in some direction, and then find another good point, not far away from the initial one, and form an ensemble from this point. Excuse me, what is an ensemble? What does it mean? Uh, so let's say f of w is the predictions of our neural, neural network, and we have two neural networks. Uh, ensemble looks like this. We use predictions of uh, average predictions as the predictions of our ensemble. And why, why don't you just uh, draw the second neural network by of the, Why do you draw exactly ensemble? Mm. And okay, if we you propose to draw uh, error of the five uh, T. Yes, but it's quite a different thing. Uh, so um, error of this. Network and the error of the ensemble is the different So yes, I understand. But it's maybe the second one is better or worse. Uh, but we have already explored that, no. and we know that it is uh, approximately of the same quality. Yeah. Now we're exploring the potential of ensembling. Well, ensembling makes sense or not? <coughs> doesn't it mean if uh, it is of the same quality? Doesn't it mean that if we ensemble it, uh, we will get the same? No, no, it doesn't. And this is why we, we, we bought this. It's like, I think, genuine first. idea behind all assembly. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then so the quality is approximately the same, but it's different. Okay. Uh, there is some diversity. Pre Productions are uh, Then I have another question. Why do you ensemble as uh, an ar arithmetic average? Why, why, why not uh, minimum or geometric average? I think yeah, it's just, just standard ten, uh, technique for assembling neural networks. You just average yeah, predictions. Yeah. And then analyze out your parameters, and so that's why you have to. Yes, but uh, this kind of averaging uh, it corresponds to convex averaging. You right? can pretend that there is some distribution over parameters, <laughs> and uh, you are essentially marginalizing over the. Uh, so this is this f actually is uh, in classification problem is something like um, probability of y given x and weights. And here you have different weights, so you can imagine that these weights actually came, that you are actually estimating <coughs> the marginal uh, probability of y given x, where you marginalize the weights out. 
By the way, I already have probabilities. I love probabilities. Probabilities. So, so how, how does this answer the question why exactly everything you got? Uh, because uh, when you're estimating this uh, expectation, you're doing Monte Carlo estimation. And uh, it essentially just estimates, just you draw random weights uh, as we did, as we kind of did here. And, uh, yeah, right. In Monte Carlo estimation, there are thousands of compilings, not just two. And well, this is just two oh, sample oh, right. estimation. Thank you. I think that just one small justification that F is a vector of probabilities, right? Yes, predictions. Yeah, our prediction. Okay. So the main insight we get from this picture is that we can make some small step from the good point and find another good point such that ensemble of this point uh, will get our increase in the course. But uh, at this curve, it looks like uh, the blue curve is kind of random at the bottom, so you are not better than W1. So it's yes. like a, a random noise. Yeah. <laughs> it's so quite a lot. Yeah, it's a good point. So, uh, and if you want to do ensemble in this fashion, you we have to do it like quite fast because if we spend a lot of computation to try to uh, train an ensemble, wait, wait, like one more comment. Sorry. Like when you do this, you are not allowed to do this on the test set. You have to do this on validation. You understand yeah. that? Of course. So, of course, uh, we are. Why are you making the test set there? That's a big deal, isn't you know? it? So we are not proposing secure ensembling techniques. No, much better to write validation error there. Just do that. You are not allowed to test many models on the test set, period. Sorry? You are not allowed to test many models on the test set, period. So that's it. Because yeah. that's what we did. Yeah, but actually, we don't say that. Like Guys, let us close this discussion. You, you can continue after seminar. So here we care about the, some kind of fast ensemblage, and where is the. Nice paper about that. It's called Snapshot Ensembles. It provides a way to train an ensemble of neural networks in time required to train a single model. So uh, here we have the training curve for the like for some neural network which could be trained in the 300 epochs. And Snapshot Ensembles propose to uh, divide this 300 epoch in the six cycles. Six training cycles. At first, we do um, usual training cycle without uh, but shorter. So we train for our level for 50 epoch, it can't learning rate to zero, and we obtain first model. Then we increase learning rate to initial value and start another cycle of 50 epochs and obtain second model. So we use cyclical learning rate schedule and. We obtain six models in times required to train one model. And it turns out that ensembles of these snapshot models work quite well. And it's kind of the best type of ensemble you can get in the time needed to train a single model. So it's a cheaper way to obtain an ensemble of networks. Uh, inspired by our observations about the curves, we propose to make some uh, changes into the snapshot ensemble stream. First, we propose to use smaller learning rates. So in the basic snapshot ensemble, you increase your learning rate to the initial value, let's say 0.1. Instead of this, we propose to increase it not very much, let's say to the value of 0 0.005 and start, from, uh, start the next cycle from the this value of learning rate. Also, as we don't want to go far away from the good point, we propose to shorten the cycle, training cycle. So here's the plot. So we use cyclical learning rate schedule. We use here piecewise linear schedule, but you can use any kind of schedule you like. Here we have the test error as a function of the iteration. Can I ask another fun question? Yeah. Uh, have you done choice of all these parameters by looking at, the, at this test error? <laughs> so you, you that's that's very bad. Actually, no. 
about that like it's, uh, it's just the concept it's concept of what but that's like uh, that's not that's real data that's not made up plot yeah and that's test error that's you you, you evaluate on that yeah. test error like all all of this stuff yeah that's true please don't do this again okay uh, and the last, so the black circles denote the moments when we collect snapshots for ensembling. And uh, at the bottom plane, we have a distance from the initial point as a function, the iteration number. So we can see that we constantly go in some direction from the initial point. Uh, here is the comparison of our method called fast geometric ensemble. FG ensemble with the snapshot ensemble. Uh, so here we use the term training budget. Training budget is the number of epochs required to try to train a single model. Here we again have test accuracy. Uh, no, now it's it's not test error. It's accurate. Okay, okay, okay. So that's completely different. <laughs> uh, it's a conceptual <coughs> showing that's happening. So in the snapshot ensemble, uh, like blue points corresponds to snapshot ensembles and the green points corresponds to our ensemble. Uh, so snapshots divide the training budget into four equal cycles and the first snapshot turns out not to be very well performed network. And in our method we start we do a lot long period of training before start collect snapshots and when do short cycles for snapshots. So we collect uh, more accurate models and our models turns out to be quite diverse to uh, achieve increase in the performance of the ensemble. And when uh, our budget is end, we start this procedure from the beginning. So at this point we choose new initialization and run all the procedure from the beginning, but uh, we use points collected before to form an even bigger ensemble. Why not continue forming a big and big ensemble uh, without reinitializing the weights? Because we see that uh, there's no saturation effect. It's like that we could continue more and more, and we would increase the. At some point, we. Uh, you can generate all the time. So you use down and down and then you start uh, No. Yeah, we use cyclic order. Yeah. So we can continue up to infinity. But it turns out that at some point the accuracy of ensemble saturates. Well, <laughs> you should really do that. But uh, we, we can't see it uh, on the plot. <coughs> yeah. So it seems that we could continue a bit more and we could improve the, the, the uh, Kind of within the same not, budget. Not that well, at, that, at to be, yes, there's a... Uh, there is a jump because that's, that's after the reinitialization. Yes, yes, yes. But then there's some kind of situation, but not 100% sure. I think, like... Uh, at 1B, we do not. And formally, we can say that these points are not such diverse as the two independently trained networks. So. Yes, I understand. Yeah. So here are the... Experimental results. Uh, so the, we experiment on a variety of architectures for different train, training budgets. We compare in the ensemble of individual training networks. It's presented in the first line of each section. Yes, yeah, so about like test error. This is exactly the place where your conclusion go wrong because you've overfitted with uh, all these like building rate scales. Like. Uh, because there, like, it would be okay if you used validation there and test here, fine. But like, uh, you're not doing that. But we but okay, fixed all uh, hyperparameters, all learning periods in advance. No, we, we made all, we tuned all these parameters. We don't tune when they operate. No, we, yeah, but still, yeah, we you did okay. make a lot of choices comparing to the original like values, so we did tune them. So like. It would be way better if you like just redo and compute everything. You need either extra test set or like uh, another like uh, round of parameters. You should forget all the parameters and tune again. 
I don't, I don't know how I can do that, but like... Uh, or the proper address validation. For instance, oh, for ImageNet, we problem. use the parameters from the CIFAR experiments and... But in ImageNet, we have a small experiment. We use a pre-trained model with this error rate and run our uh, snapshot procedure for just 10 epochs and it turns out that we... Uh, like if, if I was a reviewer, I would destroy you at this table. <laughs> And like I think I would succeed. <laughs> okay. See you on the review. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, uh, we should present this result more clearly to avoid this issue. Okay. Uh, so now we're done with the assembling part. Uh, Sorry, to yes? continue what Anton said. Could you please tell us which parameters we can just understand? So uh, here we have basically we have parameters um, which define our learning rate schedule: the maximum value of learning rate, minimum value of learning rate, and the length of the cycle. And we just choose some short cycle of four epochs, and. Um, Strategy for choosing this learning rate values is just some intermediate value of the learning rate for your usual training. <coughs> so in the intuition, we don't want to uh, error here goes very high, so we don't have to. We have to mm, use quite small learning rate. Okay. Uh, now let's switch to the last part of the talk. So after we published these results, we investigate fewer the behavior of this technique. And here we plotted the test error in the plane spanned by three points proposed by our <coughs> FG ensemble. And it, uh, we, hope, <coughs> we hope that we will see here some kind of curve. And because we wanted our method to we want to obtain the method which we will be able to traverse this curve of uh, <coughs> good perform performing network, but it turns out that in, in, in this visualization, this method uh, like, uh, jumps around some uh, wide region of good points in, in, case, in terms of test error. Uh, and we was thinking, can we? Can we just replace this network with the average? Since on such pictures, it leads to like, better generalization. And we propose another method. Just it um, looks quite the same as the ensembling method, but here we not ensemble. We average the weights of the model. So, so here we does not maintain a set of networks. We only maintain two networks. They, current weights W and the uh, average weights W is WA. <coughs> and uh, with some frequency we collect current network and average it with the previous one. <coughs> the idea and one modification we made here, we to um, change the learning rate schedule. It turns out that when we do weight averaging, we don't care about the performance of individual network we average. So we can use here just constant learning rate schedule with some not very high and not very low value of learning rate. Uh, here we have the following visualization. We uh, run network training, stop training after epoch 125. And starting from this point, we run two procedures. The first one is the conti we continue the train and obtain SGD point. And the second procedure is our weight averaging procedure starting from this point. <coughs> yeah, here we can see the test error and the train loss. The first thing that we can see is that the test error is shifted with respect to the train loss. So the optimum in terms of the train um, Loss is here on the SGT point, and it turns out that average point leads to good performance of the, on the test. So it leads to better generalization. <coughs> uh, 
Um, there are a set of papers that claims that the generalization ability of neural networks are, uh, is connected with the so-called sharpness or flatness of the <coughs> minima. The idea is that there are two types of minima, flat minima, is such minima that if you perturbate uh, your this point not very much, uh, your loss won't rise very high. And there are sharp minima when you which are not very stable, such stable points. And the intuition behind in sharpness and generalization is that train is shifted with respect to the test, and so the flat points could be more stable for this kind of perturbation. But at the same time, mm -hmm. another authors point out that there is still no strict uh, definition of the sharpness, and all current definitions are unsatisfying, and we cannot explain the generalization on their own. So, but we decided to investigate the uh, sharpness of point obtained by our procedure with weight averaging. So here we done the following visualization. We took our point obtained with SGD and we choose random directions and spun rays in these directions. And on the plot you can see the train loss in the test error as a function of the point on this rays. Spun in random directions. And we did the same thing for point obtained with our procedure. So, uh, there are two families of uh, lines on the plot. Green lines correspond to the SGT point, blue lines correspond to the SWA point. And so there are a few, uh, several lines, and each line corresponds to a different random direction. So here we can see that uh, point found by how many How many directions? Here it's about 10, 15, but you can see that in the like random directions are not very informative in this case we are, uh, we are all the same so it's hard to find interesting direction in the uh, too small yeah it's so we should at least one we should check for several hundreds of different directions to see that they're really very really stable yeah but it's like uh, quite hard to find the interesting directions in the extremely high dimensional space but we can see that for such perturbations, our point turns out to be quite stable and it's better in terms of test error and the SGD points is better in terms of trade loss. But uh, at the train loss, the A point is more stable for, high, for when we go far away from the Wispo. Uh, Okay. And another realization we did, we took these two points and connect them with the line and plot the same characteristics as a function of point on this line. So at this zero point here we have characteristics corresponding to the weight averaging and here we have SGD point. So we can see that SGD is optimal in terms of the train loss, but uh, when we go beyond this point, we have a steep increase in the loss function. So we uh, can say that this point is somehow sharper than this one, and here we have a flat region in both uh, test error and the train loss. And we have the same visualization for VGG. The previous one was for ResNet, and this one is for VGG. And here the situation is quite the same. When we go beyond the SGD, we have a steep increase in loss, and the average point lay in the middle of this wide valley of good points. Uh, so we started this part of weight averaging with the 
uh, ensemble and here we draw connections between the ensembling and the weight averaging. Uh, let's say f is a prediction of our neural network as a function of weights. For simplicity we consider a scalar function f. You can think of it uh, as a like probability for a particular class. <coughs> we suppose that this function is twice differentiable and we assume that points proposed by our ensembling uh, method are concentrated along, uh, around the average point. We denote the delta E at I as a difference between WI and WSWA and here we note that the sum of uh, all deltas is equal to zero since uh, it's the property of the mass center of these points. So when we do ensembling, we average not the points, we average predictions. So we average, average the outcomes of our function here. Uh, let's consider the Taylor expansion of our function in the, in the average, in the mass center. And if we consider the difference between the predictions of ensemble and predictions of average point, we can see that it has second order of smallness with respect to delta, where delta is the maximum of norms of delta i. And delta i is what? Is the distance between the average point and the... Yeah, delta yeah. i is... <coughs> At the same time, the like, difference between wi and wg, mm, j uh, has first order of smallness with respect to delta. So, if our points are concentrated close around the mass center, when we can say that uh, weight averaging could perform as a good approximation of the ensemble. So equivalently, we may propagate expectation inside a nonlinear function, right? Yeah. So which holds is our point is quite close, so in terms of the like variance networks pa paper, it be called as a low diversity ensemble, mm -hmm. low variance ensemble. Uh, so, and here are the experimental results for the weight averaging. We compare conventional SGT training, uh, ensembling, and the weight averaging on the different architectures, including the novel pyramid net and shake shape. Here you can see that uh, using weight averaging we can improve the quality of conventional training and we obtain performance comparable to the performance of ensemble. And here we have uh, ImageNet experiments. Here again we start from the pre-trained networks and then run our weight averaging for just 10 epochs and we are able to achieve performance on the uh, increase in performance on the test set uh, by value of 0.6%. Uh, another thing we can do with the uh, weight averaging, we try to train a network without changing learning rate during the whole training procedure. So we choose some learning rate, fix it during the training, and at some point we start to average uh, points proposed by SGT with constant learning rate. So blue cor corresponds to the training curve with the conventional decayed learning rate and green curve is the SGD with the constant learning rate and the red curve is the uh, test error of the average points from the, this constant learning rate SGD so we can see that even with the constant learning rate we can outperform uh, conventional training if we use average so it's quite surprisingly that um, in highly non-convex setup, our weight averaging work works quite well and leads to better generalization. So, we consider the following directions for the future work. It is uh, improving the training accuracy and the ensemble creation. Also, we think about 
the deriving some more effective Bayesian methods for neural networks. So if we know something about the geometric properties of lost surfaces, when we know something about the geometric structure of the posterior distribution. And we hope that we can use this insights to propose some more effective posterior approximations of, or some uh, MCMC methods that will be able to traverse these curves of low error. Also, we can somehow we can, uh, <coughs> propose new methods which are <coughs> can avoid uh, adversarial attacks. So, that's all. Uh, how is it going to tell adversarial attacks? Yeah. Everything is related to adversarial attacks. Mm -hmm. huh? Everything is related to the serial attacks. So, By uh, what mean? This I is all the first ensemble. So, we urgent leads to better generalization, so it's interesting how it's connected with the adversarial attacks. But the, the working hypothesis is that uh, it doesn't uh, avoid <laughs> the adversarial yes. attacks. Yeah, okay. Well, but okay, we'll check. Sure. I think it's maybe an interesting direction. Yes, but. Uh, it seems that um, <coughs> this procedure, well, when you, when you average uh, the weights which you obtain from a stochastic gradient optimization with a constant learning rate, actually you just average some samples from posterior distribution according to Langevin dynamics, right? Yeah. And averaging samples leads you to, to better estimate of the mean rather than uh, MIP estimate. So probably these results show that uh, uh, the, the generalization ability of the network, which is um, uh, located at the mean of our posterior distribution. Well, by, by mean of posterior distribution, I mean the mean of, of, of one mode of posterior distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, it has better generalization ability than the generalization ability of the network located in MIP point. Do you agree? Yeah. So in some sense, mean is better than MIP. Mm -hmm. This is the main conclusion we, we, we could probably make from the current uh, experimental yeah. results. Mm, actually, it's not clear whether the global mean of the true posterior would be any good because there right. are yeah, because of non convexity. And it yes. might well be at the zero, exact zero. This is why I asked uh, that by, by telling mean of posterior, I mean mean of one mode of posterior. Yeah. But with ignoring all other modes. Because according to Langevin dynamics, we actually sample just from one mode from some neighborhood of work, uh, one more, not from the whole posterior distribution. So, okay, so. what is the simplest architecture on which you observe these lost surfaces? Uh, I mean the curve between any two points. We tried fully connected architecture on the NIST, and here there exist, uh, exists such paths between modes. And also we tried shallow convolutional networks on the C far, free convolutional networks, free convolutional layers and free fully connected. Is it true if we take just two layers, it would be enough to observe this curve? Yes, actually there is a paper, uh, it, there is a theoretical paper about the, uh, this the connection, and it claims for that for two layer real network, where all this is, uh, level sets are always connected. But the theoretical analysis are restricted to this two-layer case. And because of over parameterization, because the same yes, result it's would related be with the obtained by different the, weights of the train mm -hmm. uh, data distribution of the parameterization the number of parameters in the network. But what is interesting here is that we do not connect uh, the equivalent uh, local extremes. So the local extremes are, are different. This is why we we, we observe some improvement when assembling with respect to these two neural networks. Uh, so this is not due to some kind of symmetries in the network. Yeah. This is something different phenomenon. Yeah, at first I think that um, these curves maybe use some redundancy in the parameterization and maybe intermediate points are not quite uh, meaningful, but it turns out the uh, intermediate point could provide us diverse, uh, it, different uh, so it has some differences between, uh, like with the endpoints. So here we found some like different points we put in the middle of our curves. Uh, 
Which uh, intonation do you use when you learn the parameters of your curves? Is it the average of uh, two network weights or it yeah, is Yeah, we random? just started from the Wiz curve. We can uh, use such intonation both for uh, Bezier and Polychain. Any more questions? If not, then let us thank the speaker. So I think we'll keep you in touch with the, the further results. Because we have some, some ideas which can be potentially quite fruitful. Uh, and which, which may enrich our mathematical tools for building uh, better variation approximations for the posterior distributions and based on neural networks.